Welcome to the second part of Sailboat Policy. Today we're going to see the different types and the early signs. Depending on which part of the brain has been damaged, different part of the body will be affected. When one or two limbs from the same side of the body are affected, we call that hemiplegia. When only the legs are affected, we call that diplegia. When both your legs, arms, trunk, face are affected, we call that quadriplegia. The severity of the cerebral palsy can be assessed using the Gross Motor Function Classification System. To assess the upper limbs, you can use the MAX score. Depending on the people, the severity might be slight, moderate, or severe. Now, let's have a look at the different types of cerebral palsy. The most common type of cerebral palsy is called spastic and is due to damages to the motor cortex. Well, that's because some neurons in this area are responsible to regulate muscle tone. If any damages happen to those neurons, they cannot inhibit muscle tone. Therefore, they become overexcited. This type of cerebral palsy is characterized by obviously spasticity, hypertonia, hyperreflexia, sniff. Spastic cerebral palsy covers 70% of cases. Let me introduce you Haifa. Haifa the greatest. Haifa is a good example of a spastic cerebral palsy with diplegia. Of course, she has physical limitations, but she can also do pretty tough things. Keep going Haifa, you're a queen. The second type of cerebral palsy is called dyskinetic. This type of cerebral palsy is caused by damages to a structure called the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia refers to a group of subcortical nuclei known as the globus pallidus, the putamen, the caudate, the substantia nigra, and the subthalamic nucleus. The basal ganglia works with different areas of the brain to regulate and prevent certain movements. If this structure is damaged, that means that unwanted movements are just free to go. That's why people with this type of cerebral palsy can seem restless. And we can find three different forms of this type of cerebral palsy goal. Chorea, athetosis, and dystonia. There are differences between them, but the thing that they have in common is that they cause involuntary movements. Liz is a good example of this kinetic cerebral palsy. We can see that by the way her body seems to never stop moving. And this is happening from her toes to her face. I know it might look disturbing, but her mimics are just out of her control. She cannot do anything about it. Keep going, Liz. Another type of cerebral palsy is called ataxic and is due to your damages to a structure called the cerebellum. The cerebellum helps us with coordination and fine and precise movements. If this structure is damaged, people are going to look clumsy, uncoordinated and shaky. And finally, let me introduce you Mary. Mary is actually a good example of ataxic form. We can see that by the way her arms are getting high in the air when she starts standing. Once again, she's trying the best she can to control her arms, but she cannot do anything about it. Keep going, the good work, Mary. So those are the three types of cerebral palsy you can find, but you can also have a mix of them. And here we are mainly talking about the motor functions. As I mentioned earlier in this video, people may also have problems feeling objects, speaking, cognition, epilepsy. Well, you have to know that around 50% of children with cerebral palsy have some kind of speech impairment. Cerebral palsy involves a global care. So now we're gonna have a look at the risk factors. The number one risk factor that has been spotted is prematurity. But most babies were born full term. Risk factor number two, low birth weight. It has been shown that when babies were under 1500 grams, they had a 70% chance more to develop cerebral palsy. But we can also find many, many risk factors at different stage of pregnancy and after. But in 50% of cases, people with cerebral palsy were born with no risk factors. What can we do about that? Well, it has also been shown that the earlier the diagnosis, the better for the treatment. There is unfortunately no cure for cerebral palsy. However, we can manage its symptoms. So now I'm going to present you the early signs. The diagnosis relies essentially on clinical signs such as trunk hypertonia, limbs hypertonia, and a delayed motor development. To classify the clinical signs, you can use the Heinz score and the GMA. 
If anything suspicious has been found, we can use the MRI to support the evidence. All that being said, the most important thing to remember is that yes, they have motor skills impairment, but they can think and feel just like everybody. They can be sad, but they can also be happy. So stop feeling sorry for them. Just treat them as equal. It feels weird that I have to mention it, but believe me, I have heard pretty weird stories. That's it for today. I hope you found this video helpful. Don't forget to subscribe and comment and see you next time.